Good morning. Let's stand together and praise God. something a little fun, a little bit different. We're going to be doing a responsive reading. Uh, so what will happen as we go through this verse is I will read the first line, and then you'll sing, or you won't sing, you'll state the second line out loud. Uh, this is important for three reasons. One, it's historical. Uh, this is a liturgical thing that the church has done uh, for millennia. This is known as the great halal in some uh, Jewish traditions. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, I just wanted to read this before we get there. When Solomon finished building the temple, it says this in verse 3, it says, All the Israelites were watching when the fire descended and the glory of the Lord came on the temple. They bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. They worshipped and praised the Lord, for he is good for his faithful love endures forever. They quoted this very passage that we'll be reading today. The second reason this is important is because these verses would be repeated so that they would be easier to remember. As we repeat these long verses, I want you to remember this throughout the week. I want the sound of everyone singing it together, saying it together, to go throughout your mind throughout the week. Whenever something happens, I want you to remember in your mind, his faithful love endures forever. And then finally, it's just a beautiful thing to hear other saints saying the same praises to the Lord as you are. We are blessed at Brownsville Baptist Church with a loving church family. And let us not take that for granted. Listen to the voices around you. Before we do it, I do want to practice just once to see if y'all got it in you. So I will say, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. That was pretty good. Let's try one more time, a little louder. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let's do this. Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. He alone does great wonders. His faithful love endures forever. He made the heavens skillfully. His faithful love endures forever. He spread the land on the waters. His faithful love endures forever. He made the great lights. The sun to rule by day, the moon and stars to rule by night. He struck the firstborn of the Egyptians and brought Israel out from among them. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, he divided the Red Sea. 
and led Israel through. His faithful love endures forever. But hurled Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. He led his people in the wilderness. He struck down great kings. His faithful love endures forever. And slaughtered famous kings. His faithful love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites. His faithful love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan. His faithful love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance. His faithful love endures forever. An inheritance to Israel, his servant. He remembered us in our humiliation and rescued us from our foes. He gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Amen. Would you speak to your neighbor, let him know how glad you are to see him. And let's continue to worship him.
Y'all, there's a new song that I've picked up, and I absolutely love it. And for right now, it's my all-time favorite, and I've got to teach it to you. You've got to know this. You've got to sing this. Let's go through it one time, and then we'll do the whole thing.
Good morning and welcome to worship at Brownsville Baptist Church. I'm glad that you are here. Right now we're going to enter into the time of our worship service. It's good to worship and gather together where we get to collectively come to the Lord and pray together. And we decided as a staff that we're going to begin the new year praying for our government specifically. We got three branches. We're going to take you back to social studies in eighth grade. We got three branches of the government. And uh, over the next three weeks, we're going to pray for each branch. And the first branch of the government is the executive branch that we're going to pray for today. It's the U.S. federal government's executive branch. They do a lot of decision making, so you will see the need for prayer here. We have been gifted a great, great thing in the United States of America. We've been gifted a country where we have the freedom of religion. We are not facing persecution like our brothers and sisters are in other areas of the world. We have a great, great privilege here in this. And yet, we do see that there is a need for us to pray for the governing authorities over us. It is a very biblical thing for us to pray. But I'm excited because we get to bolster up our prayers. And it's a big deal. We're going to talk about it later in the sermon. But our prayers are so special and powerful. And so I want us to petition the Lord's best and his leadership over those who lead us. So we're going to lift them up. Secondly, we are going to pray for our sister church here in Brownsville. Zion Baptist Church is led by Pastor Mike Young. And I'll even give you a specific way to pray for this sister church. They are searching for a youth pastor. They called for Aaron. I said, you can't have him. Um, and, uh, but we do. We need to pray for the Lord to bless them and lead them in their search. Pray that God calls a called man to come and lead, um, that we can cooperate and collaborate. What I love about being a Southern Baptist is our cooperation with sister churches. We've learned a long time ago that we do well cooperating together, and so we will pray in that same spirit and pray for the witness and vision of Zion Baptist. Pray for Mike as he leads them to be effective soul winners, and pray for their kingdom and prayer. And then um, we're going to take some time and pray for a missionary couple that we, as Brownsville Baptist Church, support monthly. Hunter and Chelsea Harris came from Covington, Tennessee, and uh, they have gone to Pisa, Italy, um, to, to, to serve an area that is 0.03% evangelized. I want to say that one more time, 0.03% evangelized. There's a great lostness where they are, but I'm so grateful that God has sent them, and we can pray for them today that their gospel witness is effective, and that because of their faithful going, many will come into the kingdom. So let's go to the Lord now on your own, uh, and, uh, and let's, let's pray, um, and I will close this in a moment, but you go now and pray to the Lord.
Lord, you are a mighty fortress. You are. You are sovereign, and your great name is famous through all creation. You possess all power, glory, and authority. And you are able to lead, impress, and guide our executive branch of our government. Lord, you are able to aid in Zion's youth pastor search. And you are able to resource Hunter and Chelsea Harris as they have gone to make your name famous in Italy. We believe now that you can take these prayers and hear them. And we submit to your sovereign will, knowing that you desire for your kingdom to grow. So we pray to that end, and we praise you all the way. And it is in your matchless and wonderful name that we pray. Amen and amen. I'm excited because we get to move into a time now where we are going to worship the Lord through giving. And as we give to the Lord, uh, we get to do so with cheerful hearts, declaring that God owns our affections and our trust, that we do not have misplaced trust in our provisions to take care of us, but that from God's very hand, he gives us everything that we need, and we can joyfully give back to him with confidence that he will take care of us, because he's taken care of us to this point, amen? And so we get to joyfully worship the Lord by declaring that he is king and provider. And so I'll go ahead and ask our ushers, come forward now, and we will prepare to take up our gifts uh, and our collections as we start the new year prioritizing giving to the Lord. And I have a special treat for you because as we give, we get to hear from our sanctuary choir. Can we just thank the Lord for our sanctuary choir? And they're going to lead us with an offering of tabernacle.
praise. Give them praise. That was an amazing offering. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open it to the book of Revelation. Chapter 5, we are going to anchor our time in that book, that prophetic book. Um, but as you are turning there, I'm excited to continue in this series, The Church, God's Called Out People. And so I hope you brought your Bibles with you and I hope you brought a notebook ready to take some notes. Uh, because we are going to go over the distinctions that make the church so, so special. And last week, I want to remind us that we considered the church that gathers. We went into the distinction of what it means to fellowship as something more than just social gatherings. And that the fellowship of the church, when the church gathers, it is sweet. And when the church gathers and its fellowship is sweet then God adds to the number those who are being saved. And we got that out of Acts chapter 2. But this morning, we're going to shift from the church that gathers and consider the church that glorifies. We're going to consider the church that glorifies. And as you've picked up by now, we are essentially doing a series to kind of remind ourselves who we are as Brownsville Baptist Church and why we exist. And we're going to, again, by way of reminder, go over our missions and our values statements. And the reason why we are doing this and putting this in front of you is I want you to be totally confident and have it proven to you that our mission and our values come straight from God's Word. These aren't things that we have pulled. We didn't hire a promo company. We didn't have social reps that said, hey, your branding will be good if you did things this way. No, no, we collectively agree through a vision committee that you put together so many years ago to arrive on the fact that this is not a new identity for Brownsville Baptist Church. We simply just looked back over the almost 200 years of faithfulness of Brownsville Baptist Church and said, these values, this mission is simply what we've always been about because this is what the Bible has told us we ought to be about. So our missions statement is this, and as we consider the church that glorifies, I want you to look for some key terms here. And our mission statement is, Brownsville Baptist Church is a family of disciples of Jesus Christ in West Tennessee, bonded by grace and commissioned by love to see the kingdom of God advance through the power of the Holy Spirit to the ends of the earth for the glory of God alone. Our value statement reads as this way, and again, Look for key terms. Brownsville Baptist Church exists to glorify God in our worship, in our fellowship, in how we love one another, and all that we do. We exist to grow and nurture disciples intentionally and see every person in every generation mature in their personal walk with Jesus. We exist to be a light in West Tennessee to our neighbors and to all nations as we are going and living lives as disciples who make disciples through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we consider the church that glorifies in our missions and values statement, I want you to understand this, that both statements reference the glory of God. The mission statement, the phrase glory of God alone, acknowledges the transcendent reality of God's emanating radiance and awesome power. We casually talk about the glory of God as if it's just some pithy concept. I want to remind you biblically that the awesome glory of God is so great no one can stand in front of it without being incinerated. 
The glory of God is so awesome and the magnitude of the radiant glory of Jesus embodies the very representation of the glory of God. Hebrews tells us this. He's the exact imprint of the radiant glory of God. But that representation, the awesome glory of God was so much so that God told Moses on Mount Sinai to hide within the rock and even the trail of the presence of the glory of God was almost too much for him to stand. The glory reality of God interacting with his people was so great he went to speak and the people of God said, we can't hear that again lest we die. The magnitude of the glory of God, we must acknowledge this as something so transcendent, something so other than our understanding, it's far beyond our fathoming. But in the value statement, I want you to notice this language. Brownsville Baptist Church exists to glorify God in our worship, in our fellowship, and how we love one another and in all that we do. The mission statement acknowledges God as glorious. We understand, we acknowledge the glory that exists in God's nature. However, the value statement acknowledges how we respond to God as being glorious. In a similar manner, I want you to notice how the Apostle Paul responds to all of this. Let's look real quick at Romans 11.36. Romans 11.36. I want to just kind of set this up because this is all meaningful. This week, I watched an amazing interview where it was a dialogue between Stephen Lawson, Alistair Begg, John MacArthur, and R.C. Sproul. And they were having a conversation about the glory of God. And anytime I listen to those guys, I feel so dumb because they are so smart. I could just listen to Alistair Begg talk in his Scottish accent. I would listen to him read ingredients to cookies. I mean, it's just pretty, it's easy to listen to. Maybe we could get more people here if I preached in a Scottish accent. Now let's not do that. That would be very, very weird. But they were talking about the glory of God. To this point, It was Stephen Lawson that brought this up in the book of Romans. Do you realize that the epistle to Rome is probably the greatest offering of uh, beautiful detail about the glory of God in saving sinners through the Son of Jesus? It gives us so much beauty, so much depth, uh, depth of, of just how rich the love of God is. And as The book is filleted open. It marches all the way to chapter 11 of rich theology, rich realities of what God has done for us. And then it turns into chapter 12 through 16, and it says, now this is what you do with these things. But as Paul has marched through the glory of God in the gospel reality of what Jesus the Son has done for us, he stops and just worships. He's built this big case of the magnificent glory of the Son of Jesus Christ. And he comes to this point, and he is left speechless and breathless, and all he can do is worship. And he says this, for him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I want you to see that that one verse is separated in two realities in the same way we just revealed about our values and mission statement. The first sentence of this verse acknowledges the glory of God. Notice these for him, from him, through him, and to him are all things. Friends, that is everything. Everything that you look at, everything that you see is here because of the radiant glory of the reality of the transcendent majesty of God. And when you realize the gravity that nothing around you is a mistake, that everything is put here by divine handiwork. 
and that you can know God because of what Christ has done, you recognize the glory of God. But notice the second point. You, you respond to that knowledge in the same way that he does. All you can do is say to him, be the glory forever. Because as a finite, feeble human, all you can do when confronted with the majestic glory of God is just worship. I want you to know this. Paul responds to great salvation in Christ because of the kindness of a God whose very presence could crush him. And yet, the kindness and grace that we've been shown through Jesus Christ, the Son, we should never get over this. We should always worship to this degree. But I want to do a little bit of a word study for you just for a moment. The word glory in the Greek is doxa. So when we sing the doxology, we are responding to the glory of God. We're asked, why do we open the service every time singing the doxology? As if it were to get old. Friends, Responding to the glory of God never gets old. Yes, we can do it in different ways, but for years upon years, the church has responded to the glory, reality of God by singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, you heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So why do we do this? I'm glad you asked. In the book of Revelation, we are simply entering in the song that is eternally going on in this moment. We are joining our Voices in a grand chorus that all creation is singing. And don't just take my word for it. Let's look at our Bibles and let's see this glorious reality. But before we jump into the text of Roman, uh, Revelation 5, 8 through 14, I want to establish a little context. John has been exiled to the island of Patmos, and there he is met by a glorified Jesus whose very presence is emanating with this majestic glow. And it's so terrifying for John that being in the presence of the glorified Christ, he falls to the ground as if for dead. And Jesus says, no, 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 it's okay. Come on, I need you to write seven letters to seven churches. By the way, that's a series that we're going to be doing on Sunday mornings beginning February 4th. We're going to do seven weeks and we're going to examine the seven letters written to the seven churches. You want to be here for this. Um, We'll go over it then. We won't go over it now. But afterwards, a heavenly door opens up for John as he is there taken in the spirit much like what happens to Isaiah in chapter 6. And in this heavenly door, a voice cries out and says, look, come on up. Come up here. I will show you what must take place. And in the spirit, John gains access to the throne room in heaven. This magnificent imagery, shining radiance and blinding light emanate from the throne room as he goes into the throne room of heaven. The the throne is is, is shining and around it is this rainbow that has the appearance of an emerald. You can tell at this point that John's language is beginning to fail him in trying to describe exactly what he is looking at. Could you imagine right now being taken up and seeing the awesome glory of the throne room of heaven? And then 
the vision intensifies. Peals of lightning and thunder start coming from the throne. Can you see it in your mind's eye? Four living creatures and 24 elders come into view, bowing and laying their crowns at the feet at the one seated on the throne. And they're singing, holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive, not this glory and honor and power, because you have created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. And chapter 5, the right hand of God's judgment comes out from the throne with a scroll with seven seals of judgment for the nations. And an angel cries out, who is worthy to open the scroll? Essentially, what that verse means is who is worthy? Worthy to take authority. Who is worthy to be recognized as sovereign? Who is worthy to be king? And at that, they cry out, no one in heaven on earth. And John begins to weep. In a vision, John weeps uncontrollably. But look above our passage and look at verse 5 for a moment. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Look. The lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. I love this. Do not weep. Look. I'm going to deviate for a moment. I feel led to say this to somebody in the room right in this moment. Maybe you've been in a season of weeping. And I get it, life can be a bit much and hard. In the same way, listen to me, do not weep, look. Because the lion from the tribe of Judah is on the throne. He's in control, he has all authority. And I'm not making light of the pain that you may be going through in this season. Life is hard. I get it. But don't weep. Look to Jesus. As we are examining him in the scriptures this morning, see the sovereign, awesome power of the one whom holds your allegiance. Because when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, Everything fails in comparison, even temporary affliction. All right, let's keep on going. Notice this, the lamb is worthy. So none is worthy, and yet here comes the slain lamb, Jesus Christ. And he comes in, and he takes the scroll from the right hand of Father, an imagery that always submits that he is worthy always and forever and eternally the one who can carry out the will of the Father perfectly. And as he commands rule and reign and authority, the reality of Jesus' glory is acknowledged. But let's see the response to Jesus' glory from this passage. And in our passage, we're going to see a glorifying congregation. A pretty awesome, glorifying congregation. And the first thing I want us to consider as you're taking notes is the sovereign rule of Jesus is glorified by the ancients. The ancients. What do I mean? 
the book. Look at verse 8 for a moment. When he, this is Jesus, took the scroll. By the way, I'm telling you, this taking of the scroll is symbolizing the already existence of his sovereign authority. But when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. These are the ancient ones. Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. John's scope of vision begins to move from focusing on the transaction of the Son, perfectly ready to carry out the Father's will by receiving the scroll, and then the vision backs up a bit from the throne room, from the throne itself. The vision backs up, right? And then as it does, it sees the whole divine courtroom. And notice this, that the ancients, the four creatures and the 24 elders, what do they do before the Lamb of God? They fall before him in awesome praise and wonder. Is that not what we're doing today? Are we not acknowledging the awesome power of the Lamb of God today? And if these ancient ones' response to the glory of Christ is to fall below and worship with sincere and severe devotion, what attitude did you come into this room today? And I don't say this disparagingly. I'm saying, look what you can do. Look what's available to you. Look well on the identity of the one whom we worship. Because when you see Jesus, the way the Bible describes Jesus, you see him rightly in everything worthy of worship. Sadly, we live in a day and age where people create a Jesus of their own making that just fits their motives, makes them feel really good about themselves. Largely, people worship a Jesus that you don't find in the Bible. But I submit this, that if you see Jesus for who he really is, by the way in which he's told you about his own identity, you can't help but be captivated in all wonder, worship. He holds your affections, not because who he is, but we're about to see it, but for what he's done. Notice this. Let's look as this essentially comes into this point of reverence, submission, allegiance. Jesus' sovereignty is put on display, but I don't want to jump quite yet into the song that's instigated. I want you to notice something. Look at this. This golden bowls of incense, the prayers of the saints. Somebody needs to hear this today, that this vision finds its correlation to the Israelites' prayers amid the, we just sang it, tabernacle. Where do we see this? If you're taking notes, look at Exodus 30, verse 7. And as they come before the awesome tabernacle, prayers go up like incense, but this imagery is even further used by King David. He uses this incense imagery to his prayers in Psalm 141, verse 2. But I want to take a break. When I was a younger believer, I used to say prayers in my room, and just many times as I prayed earnestly, I thought, man, these prayers are just hitting the ceiling. God doesn't have time for me. He's so important. He's got a lot more things more important than my prayers to consider. Can I tell you that I placed earthly attributes to a heavenly, glorious, divine God? And I may have done this because maybe I grew up in a situation people just didn't have time for me. And I placed that 
expectation that equally God likely gets frustrated with me. That God's patience is put out with me and if I pray, he's like, oh, you again. I can't be the only one that's felt like that in their life. What's beautiful is in this passage, you see that you never have to call into question whether your prayers go to be made public before the Father. Every one of your prayers, everything you've ever prayed, goes all the way up into the throne room and is a fragrant aroma of incense before the Lord. He listens to you because unlike earthly authority figures, he loves you and he is patient with you and he longs to hear from you like any good parent would with his kids. He's a good father. He's a holy voice, a divine God. So as the ancients bow in worship, and I noticed this, they had harps. That's kind of cool. And they're ready to break out. And what do they do? They break out in singing. Look at this. They begin to glorify. Look at verse 9 and 10. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered. And you purchased people by your blood from every tribe, tongue, and language, and people, and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they will reign on the earth. You alone are worthy. Jesus alone is worthy of worship. Why? He died according to the scriptures. Was buried for three days according to the scriptures. And he raised to walk in newness of life. Making life available according to the scriptures. He is worthy because he is the only one that didn't deserve the punishment of sin. And he took the full cup of God's wrath for what? To purchase people, a people, for his own, by his blood. Take a moment and marvel at the tapestry of the beautiful workings of God's creativity. He desires to draw all people from all nations to himself. Beautiful diversity in this multicultural, multi-ethnic family of God made in his image. Jesus' blood has made available purchasing to draw him to himself. So this is why the prayers are going up because of what he's done. Yes, who he is, but what he's done. But I also want you to see this, that Jesus then, he gives them the kingdom. He makes them priests and they will inherit the earth. But notice this, holding the bowls of incense of our prayers, the ancients glorify God for what he has accomplished not for them, for us. If you stop and think about that, they are praising not because they are getting the benefit for what Jesus has done, but because you, saints in the room, have benefited by the purchasing of the blood of Jesus Christ. And they're praising God for it. Wouldn't it be sad if they were more excited about your salvation than you? Look at what he's done. Look at what our God has done. Let us sink in. Hearing the pleas from the saints, the calls for help, the calls for rescue, the reality is that the lamb has overcome and that salvation has been purchased by the slaughtered lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, Jesus the Messiah. 
The Lamb is overcome. The Lamb is worthy. And so the glory goes up from the ancients. But now let's see the focus of John's vision back up even more to capture more of the heavenly realm. Notice how the sovereign rule of Jesus is glorified by not just the ancients, but let's see the angels. Let's see this. Look down at your Bible, verse, verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. And their number was countless thousands plus tens of thousands. And they sang. Now this is said, I'm going to go ahead and tell you as I've done a word study here. I believe the song is continuing going because of the use of the language. So it says said, I believe it should be sang. So and they so that's the way I'm going to say it. And they sang with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Imagine at this moment, you're John. And the deafening sound of this choir of angels comes into view, shaking the very foundation around you. What would your heart feel in this moment, being surrounded by the praise of this song that started out with four creatures, 24 elders, and now it expanded to this heavenly host? What would your heart feel? In this moment, you can guarantee there are more than 100 million of these heavenly hosts. The reason I say that is the number 10,000 was the largest calculation that the Greek language could express. I've tried really hard to wrap my mind around this unfathomable image, but it's just too great. Their praise shaking the very fabric of the foundation of all existence. It erupts. Worthy is the lamb continually receiving. The word here to receive in the Greek is meant to be known as and understood as you are continually worthy to receive, continually receive what? Notice this. Let's walk through these statements. Submission to the authority of his power. So you are worthy to receive our submission, our bending the knee, our allegiance to the awesome power of God. You are worthy, Lamb, to receive our submission to your authority. You are worthy to be worshipped by giving of all riches. You are so glorious, you are deserving of all riches. And whatever wisdom creation possesses, it is to be returned to the all-knowing one. All strength we have flows from the all-powerful one. And the Lamb is worthy of supreme honor, value, and devotion. And notice this. In verse 11, God was given glory, right? God was given glory because he, uh, who he is as creator. If you go back in verse 11, you see that God is described as glorious for his creation. But look at our passage. Here, the Lamb is given glory. Glory, not for who he is, but what he's done. Blessing. Blessing and honor. Blessing here in the Greek is the word eulogia. It's where we get the word eulogy. And what this simply means is to speak well of. So when you go to a funeral and someone reads a eulogy, they're speaking well of someone. One commentator says it this way, that it's Fitting that this is the end of the series of words. This entire song can be summarized as a eulogy from the angels. I like that. But moreover, let's keep looking because finally, John's senses broaden even more. Not by the vision in what he sees, but what he hears. Notice this, that the sovereign rule of 
Jesus is glorified by the ancients, the angels, and now look, all creation. All creation. Look at verse 13. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down. Now, if the sound of this angelic choir wasn't awesome enough, imagine being made aware of the sound of every created thing singing in one accord, shaking you to the bone. Now, to be clear, John is being given a glimpse of the final summation in this moment. The same image Paul alludes to in Philippians 2, 10 through 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Creation's song, I want you to see this, has two stanzas, two parts. To the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And everyone's knee bows. Church, this is the glory of God. It is no casual thing that we do when we gather. We don't play games when we can, we don't play church in a cultural acceptable way. We come as people with deficiencies who are utterly dependent on the God of creation's expression of ransomed kindness through the Son Jesus, the Messiah, whom we bend the knee of allegiance to, recognizing his sovereign authority as bought and ransomed people, purchased by his blood. How would you like to be at this worship service? Think about it just for a moment. Say that the flyer went out for this worship gathering. Who would go? Christ followers in the room. This is your invitation. You're going. You will experience this. And every fiber in your bone knows that you were created for this purpose. To eternally Glorify the Lamb of God, Jesus the Redeemer. To join in all creation and singing the praises of the Mighty One who has conquered death and purchased you into His kingdom and set you to rule and reign and subdue the earth. This is what you're colliding into. Your life's direction is headed this way. Why do I see this? Because there's a lot to be discouraged by in the modern news. There's a lot of things that are just unfavorable. There's a lot of events that cause travesty and pain and horror. But don't we look at the lamb. The lion of the tribe of Judah is roaring with power. He is the one whom we worship. So, what does this passage have to do with the church that glorifies? 
Well, in short, everything. Everything. What do I mean? To glorify Jesus is the natural response to the salvation he has purchased with his blood. The natural response of the soul to the gospel. It is the gospel that birthed the church. And we're still not over it. The church glorifies a glorious gospel in tune with all creation, glorifying a glorious gospel. Never grow tired of the good news of the ransom blood of Jesus. Never deviate from the glory of the reality that by himself God became killable, stepped into his creation to save people that didn't deserve it. That's why we sing songs like all creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam. Thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. 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 Why do we start the service with the doxology? This is why. Stand to your feet. Right now. Let us respond. Right now. And whether you were conscious of this before, doesn't matter because you're conscious of it now. Let's sing the doxology and join our voice with creation's choir. Praise God from whom all blessings I do that right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe see it. Brownsville Baptist Church exists to glorify God. Brownsville Baptist Church exists to glorify God in our worship. Like we looked at last week in our fellowship and how we love one another and in all that we do. We exist to respond to the glorious gospel with these tangible actions. And can I tell you, beloved, it is a joy. But maybe you're here and you've yet to personally experience this. As we've discussed, this is where for the Christ follower, all creation is moving. The heavens, those on the earth, and those under the earth. At the name of Jesus, at the summation of all things, every tongue from every tribe will confess that Jesus is Lord. 
Whether you do it now or then has two very different ramifications. This is why Paul tells us in Romans 10, chapter 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and what we've just seen in the passage means you bend the knee and submit to his lordship. You make him the boss because do you see that even the elders, the creatures... They're all bending the knees, falling to the authority of the Lordship. The problem is, is we don't like the idea of putting someone on the throne other than ourselves. But really, salvation can be summed up in this way. It's salvation by the allegiance of your heart. Does Christ have your obedient allegiance? We've falsely taught for a long time, just say Jesus is Lord. No. Saying and confessing are not the same. Confessing the lordship of Jesus means you bend the knee to his lordship. And there's a second part that we don't have a problem with. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Well, the problem with just belief is that even demons believe and shudder. Salvation is a coin with two sides. Lord, Savior. Many people want a Savior and they don't want a Lord. But can I tell you, friends, you don't get a Savior without a Lord. Maybe someone needs to confess for the first time the Lordship of Jesus today. Maybe, just maybe, whether you're here in the room or you're watching the live feed, you've come to the realization that you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Can I tell you, you've skipped a massively important step. But I got good gospel news for you today that you can clean this up, that you can swear fealty to the king of kings that you can come pledge allegiance to Christ and his cross and what does the verse say you will be saved for someone today is the the day of salvation come to the cross and find forgiveness maybe you're here today and you're ready to start 2024 off the right way, and you want to join in the missional effort of Brownsville Baptist Church, i got good news for you. I know somebody that can make that happen. Come forward, and you can respond in that way. But maybe you're here, and you are one of the people I spoke about In the beginning of the message, you've been in a season of weeping, and you're ready to look at the Lion of Judah. It's good to come forward. You can come and kneel. Bring your cares and concerns upon the steps which we can treat as an altar. And I guarantee you, you will find a loving brother or sister that will come and pray for you. But however the Lord is asking you to respond, don't leave here today and not be obedient. I heard a faithful pastor say this. I say it a lot. I don't ever give him credit. Tommy Vinson used to say this. He was a faithful friend. Saying no to Jesus today doesn't make saying yes to him tomorrow easier. However the Lord is calling you to respond, you come now. Father, we turn to you in this moment. Be with the person and give them the strength to come forward and respond in whichever way you're calling them to obedience. We trust you now. 
We worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, respond, and you come. Praise the Lord for his word, for his worthiness of our worship. What a beautiful, beautiful message we heard today. I want to remind us that this week we begin some renovations in our church. So next Sunday, if you come in here, you'll be the only one sitting in here, and I don't want that for you. So next Sunday, same time as usual, we're going to be over in the gym. Over in the gym. Did everyone hear me? Over in the gym. We will be having service and I, th I think we'll have a fun time doing that kind of changing things up changing the atmosphere for a little bit uh kind of stretching uh our patience maybe but we're gonna have a good time also if you are a parent in here and you are interested in bringing your kid to d now please come to our luncheon that we're having in the fellowship hall afterwards lunch will be provided and in fact let me go ahead and extend it if you are interested in volunteering and would like to talk to me about it uh, you can come to that luncheon as well, hear more information about D-Now, uh, and we'll get that settled in. Uh, finally, uh, in your handouts this morning, in your bulletins, you got one of these. Did everyone get one? If you don't have one, they're going to be up front with the rest of the bulletins. Uh, but this is a new schedule, a new schedule that we'll be implementing for our weekly routine. This will start on Sunday, January 21st. Sunday, January 21st, and that following Wednesday is the first week that we'll be using this new schedule. Uh, if you did not have it, I believe that we have it up on the screens for us, is that right? Yes, I don't know if you can read that, yeah. Uh, so on Wednesdays, five to six dinner, 5.30 to 6.30 handbells, children's choir, bridge, and youth will all start at six. They'll end at seven, youth will end at 7.30. And then they'll have a praise boost from 7 to 7.30. And then on Sundays, uh, same morning routines, 8 to 8.45, praise run through, 9 to 10, Sunday school, 10, 15, 11.30, Sunday service. And then in the evenings, adult choir has moved to Sunday evening, 4 to 5.30, and then children's Awana and discipleship, 6 to 7. If you have any questions or if you did not get one and you need one, please come see us. We will make sure that you get one. We'll send out an email as well. Make sure that everyone knows the new schedule, uh, and that'll be good. Amen. All right. One last bit of information, just so for you guys to be aware, that uh, we're going to give giving receipts through email. Uh, and so these are going to go out. Um, and uh, if you would still like a physical copy of your giving receipt statement, you can uh, call the office and we can produce a physical copy for you. But if not, go ahead and be sure that you will find these in your email. I want to say a word of blessing, but before I do that, I love you. I love what we're doing here. I love where we're going as a church. And I love that we are united in doing it. Know that we are here to see the glory of God extend to all the earth. And it can happen from Brownsville, Tennessee. May the Lord bless you. 
and may he keep you. May he cause his face to shine about you, before you, within you, and from you. May he be gracious. May he lift up the light of his countenance. And may he bring you peace. You're all dismissed. Thank you.